hello from me, everybody. As you can see, um, or as you can probably guess, my presentation and my uh, method was at least a little different from uh, what Peter just presented. At this presentation, I chose the title, First Look at Requests and Refusals in Ihanzu. Um, the aims of uh, this little study were to investigate the politeness strategies in Ihanzu. And I chose to focus on requests and refusals in different social contexts. And um, basically, I wanted to yeah, very broadly, broadly saying, um, examine the pragmatic ele elements governing polite interactions. The real question is sometimes, yeah, why pragmatics? Also, why pragmatics in Ihanzu? You can do so many other things. Um, here are just some points I came up with. I think it contributes to basically broader theories in politeness as a whole. And of course, yeah, then also to the field of pragmatics, but it also preserves the linguistic diversity and cultural knowledge in Ihanzu. And I think that is a, a really big point with languages like Ihanzu, where we have very few speakers remaining and maybe um, work like this yeah, will be even more valuable like 10, 20, 50 years down the road. And of course, it also offers insights into the social norms and in the forms of respect in communication in Ihanzu. And then ultimately, well, aids us in learning and understanding not only the Ihanzu languages, but also uh, the culture that language is used in. Looking at uh, my methodology, I chose to go with discourse completion tasks. Um, these are very, yeah, I'd almost like to say these are standard procedures in pragmatics where the um, a speaker is given a scenario and then has to act out the scenario. So it's kind of like a one-sided role play, if you want to call it that. And I designed these tasks to reflect uh, real life everyday interactions as closely as possible. Of course, I haven't been to hide them. So like everything with a grain of salt and all that. So, but I basically designed things like, okay, on the market, on the, on the road, speaking to an elder, speaking to a teacher at school, things I would, I would say are everyday interactions and hope that that aligns with uh, everyday interactions in the Hanzu. Um, in total, I came up with 40 scenarios and, um, I did not only do elicitation sessions. So um, Peter earlier explained basically that the Ihanzu speaker translated things from English into Ihanzu. I asked these questions more broadly. I didn't say, how would you translate a request? I asked, what would you say? And then also sometimes um, like went a little deeper and said, okay, what would somebody say um, who's maybe younger or like, uh, something like um what does that mean or what does that literally mean or something like that so it's not only elicitation sometimes we also talked about society that's why i say um there was also a little bit of an online interview character to that and all in all it's a very very explorative approach a little bit of a I'd almost like to say scattershot approach so really take what we can get here and then of course um like i said an aim was to observe the influence of social relationships. So uh, how the Hansa speaker talks to friends, elders, strangers, teachers, and people of other roles. And uh, I look for politeness markers specifically, like honorifics or also a kind of softness and uh, observed face-threatening acts and how they are mitigated. We'll come back to that later. So that I mean, right into it, here's, a, here's an example from my question catalog, basically, that's and what I classified as a small favor request example. And I asked the Hansa speaker, imagine you're at a friend's house and need to borrow a pen to write something down. How would you ask for it politely? And the Hansa speaker said, Kulompa, Ioelo, Nendeola, which literally means I asked for a pen so I can write. And um, he said, this is polite. But also looking at this, it is structured a little like a soft command. You will see what I mean by that in a second. If we look at a bigger favor request example, uh, here I ask the Hansa speaker to uh, request a friend's car over the weekend. And um, 
here there's already a little difference to the example before here. Here there's Andrew. Uh, so we have a term of address here and then uh, he used Kulija and not Kulumpa. So he, he said, can I get? Kulumpa is uh, more like I ask, I beg, uh, literally I pray. And um, then we have the proposition of the request basically. So here we can already see for like bigger favors, there might be a tendency here in term of address. Uh, here we also have a different verb. And um, this can I get also means it's more of a question. It's not give me, but can I, may I have something like that? Looking at recurring patterns, this one um, basically came to light quite frequently. It's like 70%. So like um, all of those 40 scenarios looked something like this, where we had a term of address. Like before we had Andrew too, right? But this, these are, can also be fictive kinship terms like here, grandfather, father, uh, and also the word boy here. And then they're connected by Kulampa to the proposition of the request. So that was very frequent. Um, but not everything is totally structured like that all the time. It would be nice if everything were that easily predictable, but it's absolutely not. What was very interesting was that this uh, question I asked for a pen so that I can write um, was by itself, if you read it like this, not necessarily a polite sentence because the Hansa speaker, um, he also said, when I asked him, how would you say this impolitely, he said the same thing, but what shifted was um, his delivery. He said it more forcefully, he said it quicker, basically he said it in a different tone, but the words all were the same. So lexically is interesting because there's no marker in that sense that seems to make it more polite. Um, and also, even though the word Kulampa often showed up in requests, it doesn't mean that is necessarily a politeness mark in any uh, sense. It's just uh, literally a lexical thing to uh, ask for something. And I was, I was digging a little to find out whether there is a politeness marker equivalent to the English please, but at least I was not able to elicit one. Doesn't mean that there isn't uh, something like that, but I wasn't able to find one in my 40 scenarios. Some other observations um, that I couldn't really get into deeper because of time constraints and scope, um, but that are very interesting things that I noticed as requests do not seem to feature high rising terminals. Like, of course, there are questions in Ihanzu and also in other languages um, that have high rising terminals at the end. But in Ihanzu, there's it always seems to go down, so to say. So um, that was a very interesting observation. There are a lot of bold on record face threatening acts. That means there's a lot of, there's not really a lot of mitigation in that sense that uh, requests are implicit. So often things are asked for pretty directly. Can I have this? May I have this? Can I get uh, something like that? And what was very interesting was that physical contact seems to matter a lot, which is interesting because um, if we basically note down polite sentences, that makes them yeah a little not that transparent anymore because we can't really see from the written form whether there is physical contact. So we really have to actually maybe do uh, multimodal analyses to see this. For example, the Ihanzo speaker said um, when he requests something from uh, his granddaughter, he would put his hand on her shoulder or um, also when he puts himself into the shoes of a child, basically, and asks an elder for something. He would take that elder's hand and things like that. So um, that is really, really interesting from my perspective. Something else that was very interesting in terms of requests uh, is the role of uh, a little proverb here. Here I chose to call this the calabash as a window into society. Um, there's a proverb that goes, in Saudai, Tiata which means, which literally means these calabashes follow each other. You can see it from my little 
uh, illustration back there. So like these calabashes, they go yeah back and forth here between houses. And that, um, that is a proverb that means something like the, the golden rule, like what goes around comes around, something like that. And what is really interesting about this usage wise is that um, when the Ihansa speaker was asked to request cooking fat from a neighbor, um, he basically, I'd almost like to say, invoked this proverb. He basically said the proverb in Saudai Tiata, and then I lack cooking fat, which I've never seen a proverb used like this before, but it seems to be a really common proverb too. I asked him whether that is a proverb that's well known in the Hanzu speaking uh, circles, and he said, Yeah, absolutely. Something he said, almost everybody probably knows that. And um, I also think it's interesting because, in a sense, that feels like it's one of the most indirect requests. There's no can I have or give me or I ask for. There's just uh, the proverb and then basically a statement here. So that is very, uh, a very, very interesting. Um, observation of this program, I think. When it comes to refusals, um, I have to say that these are basically face-threatening acts and they need to be mitigated in order to not harm a relationship. So when we tell somebody no, then we might be burning some bridges depending on how we say it. But how do we handle speakers handle something like that? Here's an example refusal where um, the Ihansa speaker was asked to refuse an elder uh, who asked him to carry something heavy. And here he used Tata, so we have the form of address here again. And then um, a justification. He said, I can't help because my fingers are hurt. So we see here the uh, term of address is very important for uh, politeness, of course. If we look at another example that is not so polite, um, where it is the same scenario, but now the refusal is impolite. Uh, the answer speaker said it's maybe a form of misbehavior. He said, Ich akenshi yana ako, which means no, tell your children to carry it for you. Um, we can see there's no uh, kinship term whatsoever in here. Um, there's the yeah, rather direct ish, which literally is no, and that is very forceful. And um, yeah, the the answer speaker really said, yeah, that is something that is considered misbehavior, something pretty impolite. So that's a big difference here. What also occurred quite often in refusals, I put some um, examples down here, is the discussion marker Ingi. Um, it often seems to introduce um, refusals when there are like some some appendages kind of like there are some explanations it basically frames this and tries to soften it um what is very interesting here is that in english the speaker chose to translate this into you know it doesn't literally mean you know it's not a verb like that but it seems to convey the feeling of oh you know so it seems to be aiming for mutual understanding empathy or something like that and then basically soften the blow of uh, a rejection, a refusal of some kind here. And then here are some key observations on refusals. Um, they're notably more indirect than requests. So we have this dichotomy here where requests are pretty direct where people ask for things directly, but in refusals, even saying the word no is kind of already frowned upon. So we often have this, um, oh, you know, uh, I can't because, or, oh, I'm so sorry, or um, sometimes also like, oh, maybe I help you do something. I can't do it for you, but maybe I help and look for something for you. So that's what I chose to title justifications, apologies, voicing of regrets, and offering of alternatives here. And of course, the discourse marker Ingi is like very frequently employed, surprisingly frequently. Then to look back on the study a little, some limitations here. Of course, generalizability, yeah, it's very limited. There's only a single uh, speaker I basically was able to interact with. And that, of course, that one speaker doesn't speak for all speakers. Maybe some things are very specific to him. Maybe not, we would have to see with some follow-ups. For the discourse completion tasks, um, 
they are nice because they are easy to come up with and basically introduce to the speaker. But there's always a question how natural the produced language actually is when there's only one speaker kind of envisioning a scenario and then speaking as if there was another speaker. Um, so that's, from my perspective, a big limitation. And then yeah, I didn't really investigate, investigate nonverbal cues. Um, that wasn't within my scope. I mentioned some things like body languages and also uh, the lack of uh, high-rising terminal and things like that. But that could also be very interesting here. And then, of course, there's some bias from my side. I mostly deal with uh, English and German, Japanese and Mandarin when I'm uh, working with languages and linguistics. So that was uh, pretty new to me to work with Ihanzu. And finally, here are some ideas for follow-up investigations. Role-play scenarios with more participants, so two or more would be really nice to maybe increase authenticity of uh, the spoken Ihanzu make it more natural, make it maybe less awkward when there's an Ihanzu speaker, you know, speaking to somebody who doesn't speak Ihanzu, maybe that changes everything totally. Focus on multimodal communication. I think that could be very interesting to see how they, how the Ihanzu speakers gesture, like how they interact, interact with each other physically while speaking. And also I think uh, investigating gender dynamics could be really interesting because there are uh, terms of address that are only used among men and only used among women. I just stumbled upon this in uh, the little interview sections, but I think that could be a really interesting jumping off point for further investigations. Yeah, and that's it for now. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, or in Hanzo, Song Yili. Great. Thank you, Raul, for uh, this presentation. I mean, I think that you, uh, 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 I think that you nailed it in saying that this is kind of something that I don't uh, encounter a lot in a field methods course, and I think that the data was really interesting, um, and it was really sort of nice to see you going through this data collection and, and see how Nico um, sort of responded. Um, also, I'm very encouraged by uh, by uh, the call for multimodal um, uh, research because I uh, I've I've become a bit of a camera guy, so it's nice to uh, it's nice to know that that's uh, that that's important. I wonder, and sort of related to that, I wonder, is there any role for like looking through the existing archival collection and see what you could what you could dredge up from there? And if that were the case, like what would be starting steps to like do that? So if we have Say for example, a hundred hours of recorded video. How would you go about even starting with that, like to look for this kind of stuff? I mean, a hundred hours—that's a—that's a big task. But um, you mean in terms of multimodal communication? Yeah, like how would you how would you start like winnowing out like what you would work with versus what you might leave to one side, like particular topics that you might look out for? Like what would what would sort of what would sort of to you look like something, okay, like this recording might be promising, or maybe like I should I should look at this one. I would firstly look if there's something like that available, uh like interactions between people from two different age groups. I think that's something that yeah like in East African culture, if I may say so, that is very important sometimes, of course, in like with Swahili speakers, we also like change even greetings and things like that. So I think there's a lot going on there. Also just from what uh, Nico basically explained, oh, if he's an elder. That at one point he said, oh, if he's an elder. And even though I'm rushing to do something, where we had an example where he was supposed to go to court, he would say the court can wait. Uh, I would help the elder find his way first because the elder was asking for directions. So I think there's a big focus on um, elders and also how younger, uh, even children behave towards elders. And I think that's a good, good starting point. Thanks. I appreciate that. Do we have any thoughts or um, comments from other participants? Do feel free to uh, raise your hand using the uh, raise hand function in the uh, chat module, um, or you can simply unmute yourself and uh, that will prompt me to pay attention to you if you ask a question. 
If you would like to um, write your question out, you can write it out in the uh, chat and uh, I can read it out as well. Stephen. Uh, yeah, so I was wondering about the point where you said, you asked him to say, you asked him how would you say something beginning with Kulompa less politely, and he repeated the same words with a different prosody. Whether that, he could have not changed the wording of it because what he thought was, you were asking how do you say this specific sentence in a a more rude way or a less polite way um so maybe yeah that he was specifically avoiding rephrasing it rather than thinking that that's what you were asking is that a possibility at all do you think that that is a concern um but of course you uh, haven't really been there um when we did this but it occurred a little differently it was Oh, it's tough to reconstruct this now, but of course we have it on recording, but maybe you remember, Andrew, when um, I asked him, this is, it was the very first thing we did, actually. And then he said, yeah, I have to say it like this. And then he said, if I say it like this, and he did the forceful one, like even Andrew said, I've never heard you speak in that voice before. He said, you cannot give it to me. So I didn't explicitly ask him for how do you say this, but he basically did it himself. And that that's when I had that little light bulb moment and was like, okay, that's interesting. Ah, okay. So like yeah, he I did see. the comparison himself. So that was, I think, but otherwise I think you're totally right with those concerns. Maybe it even still is uh, a concern like that, but it's interesting that he chose these same words himself when he totally did that very forceful delivery there. Oops. Lutz, you have your uh, hand up. Yes, thank you. Oh, this this was really interesting. Thank you. Um, you know, I was curious. You, you said when you talked about the refusal that often that comes with a reason given or an explanation, which you know I I think that you know that was good to see. But also, I almost thought the same even for the requests, that that also comes often with not only am I requesting something, but more also explaining why I'm doing it. So the example I think you had like, oh, can I borrow a pen? so that I can write something. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, what else would you be doing with this pen? So it's not like that is like, you know, you use for new information. It's not like, you know, oh, I want to write a postcard to someone, but it's just, you know, to add a little bit of motivation or, or justification. And then I, I don't know if that, if I understood that correctly, but for the bigger example, like borrowing a car, I think the scenario just that you want to borrow a car, but then the actual examples then, oh, can I borrow a car? Because I want to go to... I don't know whatever people go. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that I was curious as well that that came sort of almost automatically. So I wonder whether whether in both the, the requests and the refusals that really plays a bigger role. That not only do you ask for something, but you then contextualize it and give like you know people, you know either maybe a justification or to explain what your circumstances. Maybe there's more, more you know more empathy. I'm not you know there's many different reasons you can think of why people would do that. But it struck me your, your example that. You know, maybe maybe it was more than I would have expected, if that's the right way of saying it. Yeah, it's, what's also is very interesting in refusals is um, they're often also longer. The, I only gave a few examples because I also don't really want to flood you with examples from 40 different scenarios, right? But um, even in refusals, sometimes there's the refusal, then a justification. And then at the end of the refusal, a request by the person who refused is like, Oh, can you do this or something like that? So um, refusal are really, really interesting because they feel like this curveball that like really goes a long way, even if you know the message is no, and then there's a lot of repair in that sense. Martin, I brought up um I brought up an anecdote. You were talking about um, how arguing uh, in Iraq is so interesting. Sometimes or it was either Iraq or in Tanzania in general. You hear people arguing and you don't even really know that it's an argument. I don't know if you have any if you have any any thoughts on any any thoughts on that or you'd like to link it in any way to what you heard just then. That's in actually not a line of research uh, that is a little bit uh, more into uh, argumentation. <clears throat> uh, 
so what yeah what what bothers me about my lack of understanding of of speech in east africa is that uh, <clears throat> when i listen to people um yeah uh arguing i i not only about the tone but also about the content i i i quite often i don't understand why uh certain statements or arguments at all uh, now i must say i do have that here in the west as well <laughs> so but uh, <laughs> but uh, to degrees uh, so here i can get um you know annoyed and say well but 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 this is not solid reasoning uh, but but what i have in tanzania is that i have the feeling that that there are all sorts of um things that are arguments to to my friends which which i don't understand at all so i i'm then then uh, a, a little bit uh, shocked at how much of an outsider i am but i i think there will be interesting uh line of research if you know a language a little bit better and uh, and then uh, go into into the yeah the different pragmatic uh, theories of of argumentation um that don't especially those that that don't simply base themselves on on the greek uh, model because that that's what happens uh, 90% of the time when I see something on, on argumentation, pragmatics, it's, it's, yeah, put it in this, this, this old uh, Greek model of uh, how we should argue. But so, no, it's not, uh, um, yeah, I, I find that I, I was quiet because I, I find the, the, I find it very brave of Raul to, to take up this, this topic and, uh, Thank you. <laughs> it's inspiring that that we should do that, <clears throat> um, but it, I think, it's a very very difficult one. Um, that uh, I would find it difficult, even in in the society that I know best, and 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 the, the group of people that I know best, um, <clears throat> to to have insightful uh, research like this. Especially because, I mean, these are nice ways and, and, and smart ways to get data, but you really want to be inside a conversation and then know what is going on. And, uh, and to get that kind of... Uh, so I hope a little bit, we, of course, we have Crispina, and I was with her. She's a Iraq lady and a linguist, and I was with her in the village and talking about yeah uh, interjections and things like that and uh, and and there i found the challenge to uh, to to get to inspire her to think a little bit more about the things that that would interest me and i i guess most of you on on how these uh, interactions go whereas um uh yeah for her at the moment it seems to be still what is the low uh that that I can have easy easy publications, um, whereas she would be an asset to get much deeper into into an understanding of what's really going on. So Rosemary Beck has done a little bit of this in in Namibia uh, in, uh, in 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 how how people participate in 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 bigger events. There's a huge difference. You mentioned age, huge difference with the. Uh, the women who uh, who who don't speak unless asked to, and uh, and the order in which things are done. So uh, politeness. It struck me that for Iraqu, you can you can like like you had that a bit as well. That that you can uh, uh, a direct imperative, so not not a problem at all. Um, that is not in itself uh, impolite. And I think the the problem with the whole politeness for these requests is that um, 
whether, whether you can do it at all. And, and, and that is, of course, very difficult to, to, to research, when, uh, especially in circumstances like this. But uh, to give an example, and Andrew knows about this, when you, when, you, when you want some help in the village from your neighbors, you don't ask, but you write it on a little note, and then you ask a child to bring it to the neighbor. And that is the most effective way to do it. So there are all sorts of other kinds of indirectness that that that, that we will that we won't even record when when we try to uh, uh, to, uh, to to get at uh, uh, what are the softening. Uh, the the most important one that I I learned was with another other anecdote that I was walking from from Kremlin to the town and. Uh, yeah, meeting people, and of course you greet, and then you say, "Where are you going?" And I told him, "I'm going to Arusha." And then my my host, who was walking with me, getting extremely angry at me that I told him that, um, because uh, yeah, of course it was true, but this was not crucial information for him, and you don't just volunteer information. So um, there are also all sorts of that levels of of of. What can you, what could you ask at all? What, what, what do you uh, tell people at all uh, in, uh, which, which doesn't need mitigation, but simply needs to be avoided or, or uh, yeah, yeah. So that, that's why I think that the topic is, uh, is instructive in, uh, and, and, and not uh, researched a lot, but also very, very difficult to, uh, to, to get data that come to what I would feel to be the essence. I'm, I'm happy that I provoked you on this, Martin, because I knew that you had thoughts from, from previous conversations that we had. Any any sort of ideas that were sparked there, Raul? Anything that you'd like to respond to? Uh, yeah, thank you. It's super interesting. I totally agree with the, I almost like to call the recordability problem. But I also, I also think for something like that, like pragmatics or social linguistics and conservation efforts, if you want to call it like that, they they can and maybe should totally go hand in hand. I think like that's just very fascinating to me. And then the with pragmatics, I often feel like maybe it's because I studied at a German university, but there's a lot of focus on yeah European languages, and I've I haven't really of course the also yeah okay East Asian languages, but I haven't really read a lot about or be even been able to find that much about East African pragmatics specifically. I think that is, if one might, might call it gold mine or whatever, but like that can totally offer different perspectives. I mean, I'm just rooted in my own pragmatics, basically, right? Of the languages I speak more or less, sometimes I'm rude, sometimes I'm not. But how is it done somewhere else? Like, I think that's, that's a really exciting avenue. Uh, yeah, yeah. Othman has written, uh, and she's she's from Tanzania, and and she's written things on on politeness in in Swahili, and the other things that are written on politeness in in East Africa emphasize the the fact that uh, it's it's it shouldn't be seen as it often is in the West as an individual uh, property, but as a, a societal uh, politeness societal face. Face is not an individual thing, it's a societal thing. Interesting. Um, Raul, I, I really appreciate the fact that um, this uh, this proverb um, was so sort of insightful and was a very useful sort of hook to um, explain some of, some of these uh, strategies and to explain you know, or to at least sort of shed a light on why these things might be structured this way. Um, in your in your experience of other languages, do you find prob? Well, you mentioned that you had never heard a proverb used in a request before, but do you encounter proverbs when people talk about interactional, like you know, rules and things in different languages? Have Have you ever seen that sort of come up in? in people explaining to you how how interaction works in a language? So I was uh, very excited when I came across a proverb because I mentioned before, I've never really seen it 
yeah, like I call it invoked, like in a request, when I've come across proverbs in German, English, uh, Japanese and Mandarin, um, you can often find them in a reply, like, you know, somebody says thank you and you say, basically no big deal, but you express it as a proverb. I also asked Nico that actually, I said, could you also use this proverb in a reply and not only in the request itself, but there he said no. And that, that is what fascinated me so much. Like I really, of course, I don't know all the proverbs and all the languages I deal with, right? They would be, they would be amazing, but I've never seen something like that before. So that totally stuck out to me. And also the fact that um, this Nsauda, so this small calabash that is used for fetching water into a bigger calabash uh, has kind of this cultural association with it and um, I talked to Nico about that and whether these calabashes are still used that much nowadays in the Hanzo culture and they're not so I said it's interesting because at one point maybe the Nsauda object will disappear but it will live on in this proverb which I think is one and kind of poetic but also uh, basically yeah tells us a lot about the culture i think i think it's an interesting reminder that i, I mean i think proverbs are, are a really interesting place to 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 start for looking at some of these um looking at some of these like societal expectations little rules um you know yeah beliefs etc i think that's yeah it's quite nice um, but with that said, uh, I see that we're kind of um, approaching the end of our time slot. Does anybody have anything else that they'd like to say before I uh, before we finish? No. Uh, but... Sorry, and maybe just briefly, you know, just again, it's, uh, thank you for both Andrew you and you know all Andrew you and the presenters. Again, really interesting talks. It's really nice to see what people make with the data and you know within the constraints in which you guys have operated. Um, but it's really, really interesting to say. So again, many congratulations and, and thank you for organizing this, this little event. It's very good. Well, and thank you for coming. <laughs>